Hey guys, today's podcast is brought to you by audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash Fred. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. That's audibletrial.com slash Fred. But for now, enjoy the show. Hello everyone, I want to thank you, thank you, thank you for pushing the download button. I am kidding, bye. And I am talking to you from Montreal, Quebec, Canada. That's right, I am back. I am back from the Caribbeans. I am back from the hot weather. I am back from paradise, basically. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Montreal, Canada is paradise also. Uh, but I have to admit, going from you know, uh, 30 degrees to minus 30 degrees is really not (laughs) the most um, fun adventure. And um, anyway, I'm back home. I'm back here in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. And you are listening to the book Geek Unchained. I want to wish you a happy new year. Uh, This place, this podcast, this show, is home to literary marvels. That's right, those you know and those you do not know. I am a guy, I am a dude, I am a geek, I'm a bookworm, I'm a creative person, I'm a writer, I'm a host. This podcast is about fiction and non-fiction books that we love. Books change our lives, books entertain us, books make us grow. Basically, it is a live podcast. It is free every time you download it on iTunes or Stitcher. Please go over there and subscribe. It is listener supported. So tell a friend, leave a review or for more podcasts, free gifts, Q&A articles. Subscribe at frederickbuy.com. That's right. That's frederickbuy, like bye-bye.com. On Twitter, at ByFred. On Facebook, Frederick Buy. Just It's just my name. And my YouTube channel, The Boo Geek, for previous episodes. All right, guys. I always like to start off with something funny, and this week, it's about a man and kittens. (laughs) Listen to this. A man absolutely hated his wife's new kitten and decided to get rid of it one day by driving it 20 blocks from his home and leaving it at the park. As he was getting home, the cat was walking up the driveway. The next day, he decided to drive the cat 40 blocks away and put the beast out and headed home. Driving back his driveway, there was the cat. He kept taking the cat further and further and the cat would always beat him home. At last, he decided to drive a few miles away, turn right, then left, past the bridge, then right again and another right until he reached what he thought was a safe distance from his home and left the cat there. Hours later, the man calls home to his wife. Jen, is the cat there? Yes, the wife answers. Why do you ask? Frustrated, the man answered. Put that kitten on the phone. I'm lost and need directions. (laughs) All right, all right, guys. Um, This week's blog, We talk about, we talk from 8081 to 1924. We talk historical fiction with Shane Parkinson. That's right. She's an acclaimed author who writes historical novels set in New Zealand. The first book, Sentence of Marriage, begins in 1881 and her most recent novel, After the Roses, takes the series to 1924. Guys, she is a very kind person. She was sweet. She's You'll see it in her um, answers. I mean, go read a Q&A at FrederickBuy.com if you love historical fiction. But today, 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 we are kicking the year off with number one best-selling author, Jennifer Skotelsky. 
Who is Jennifer Skatelsky? Besides being a number one best-selling author, she is an international literary contest judge. She's an award-winning author and former literary agent. She is committed to helping writers around the world align project development with contemporary publishing demands. And today we will talk about her latest novel, Grave of Hummingbirds, a mix of mysticism and gothicism. So without further ado, you'll see how sweet, deep, insightful this interview is. I mean, I love, 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 love these kind of interviews. And uh, I mean, you, it, it was I, it was actually was one of my favorite interviews I have done so far. God bless Jennifer Skatelsky. So let's get to the conversation right after this. <laughs> Hey guys, quick thanks to RadioGuestList.com where you can find people to interview for free. For free. Or if you want to be interviewed, you can go there too. RadioGuestList.com Thank you guys for your support. And speaking of you listeners, I want to hear from you. I want to hear from you. If you would like to be on this show, to discuss a book you have written or that you loved. If you have a book recommendation or you just want to chat, email me. I want to hear from you at info at frederickbuy.com. That's info at frederickbuy.com. And for advertisement offers, use the same address with subject advertising. All right, hello, hello. So we are here with Jennifer Skotelsky. She is uh, our guest today, and uh, she will release her book, Grave of Hummingbirds, on January 1st. She is an award-winning author of Tin Can Shrapnel. Uh, did I pronounce it right? <laughs> you absolutely did. Okay, yes. okay awesome. And uh, she's also an international literary contest judge and a former literary agent. I'm glad to have you here, uh, Jennifer. Thank you, Frederick. It's lovely to be here. I'm, I'm glad you invited me. Awesome, awesome. Uh, so let's just start off with, um, give us an idea here of your, of your background. Well, I'm originally from South Africa, and I moved about six years ago to the United States. I have an MFA in, in fiction. I came here, actually, to study at San Francisco State University, And Grave of Hummingbirds was my thesis there. So I've, I've been a writer for a long time, probably since I was um, fairly small, you know, <laughs> playing with letters and things. I've always been fascinated by stories. Um, I'm also a ballet teacher. Mm -hmm. And I've always been involved in the arts to some degree. I think writing has, has been the most persistent effort, though. Um, and I'm pretty much focused now on on books and everything to do with books okay and and you mentioned that you you use grave of hummingbirds as your thesis yes back in wow that so uh, how long was that ago it not long ago in fact it was 2011 oh okay 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 but so so you started to write the book have you, uh back then you know so. the the idea was inspired by a photograph and that was a long time ago But it took, it took the story a long time to take shape. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it all came together fairly recently. Pro you know, probably I had to grow as a writer and the story had to grow and breathe. The characters needed time to grow. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, that's why it, it didn't, it wasn't a quick, yeah. a quick effort, I must say. Oh, okay. Okay. Cool. Um. So. So. Yeah. So your your next book is a uh, Grave of Hummingbirds, and it's already got a lot of great reviews. I mean, on Amazon and everything. And I, I uh, as I did a little bit of research on you, I saw that uh, you know I, I uh, read a few interviews, and uh, yeah, it was labeled as a, a stunning mystery. It was uh, also as captivating and wonderful. Um. Thank can you, you sum Can you summarize the book uh, for us? Uh, sure. It, it's the story of, of two men who react differently to the death of the women, woman they love. So 
one immerses himself in the past that he shared with her, while the other, in trying to reconstruct her likeness, becomes a killer. And the novel is set in the Andean highlands of South America, where a mutilated body is found on one of the slopes. Mm. And in the face and wounds of the winged woman, uh, my protagonist, who's Dr. Gregory Moreno, notes an uncanny resemblance to his late wife. Mm. Okay. Then a year later, when an American anthropologist visits the region, echoes of those similarities stir and ignite the superstitions of the townspeople. And of course, then also draw the killer's focus. Okay. I think, you know, I think the novel explores themes of love and loss and redemption. And it's against the backdrop of a changing rainforest, which has been devastated by drug cartels and a, and a very brutal intelligence agency. So you've got ghosts, uh, tortured ghosts and strange omens. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's basically a work of, of, of magic realism and it's, it's kind of a gothic mystery, really. Mm. Okay. That, that about sums it up, I suppose, without giving too much away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so you mentioned Dr. Gregory Moreno. Um, where, yes. I mean, okay, he seems to be a very... Um, I should say mystical character. I mean, where did you find the inspiration for him, for the doctor? You know, Frederick, he, he came to life in my mind and he actually grew on the page. Mm. He often took me to places of his choosing rather than mine. So although he doesn't resemble anyone I know, he has qualities that resonate strongly for me personally, like a, a capacity for deep compassion and love and rage mm. that at times makes his life unbearably painful okay and and okay so wh who is i mean who is your, your your favorite character from the book and why you, you, that's tricky because i mean <laughs> favorite in terms of of compelling would be gregory because of the uh -huh. depths you know his character allows me to explore explore his depths yeah. you know there's there's his love for his late wife that has distorted many of his perceptions and in some ways, it's rendered him blind to things of which he might otherwise have been aware or suspicious of. Mm -hmm. d d would you agree that, uh, you know, as a writer, um, the main characters that, you know, you can create is often just an extension of who we really are? Because I interviewed another uh, author recently, and it's the same kind of thing. Her main character is kind of like, she finds the same characteristics in herself as in her in her character well i think that's really interesting and it's true to to a large degree i think that there are aspects of ourselves that come to the fore especially if you're writing um in a way that's flowing and coming from a place that ideally you don't really understand you know it's that creative process and once that takes hold i think there are aspects of one's subconscious that that come to the fore as well. So yes, that 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 makes sense. Yeah, and I'm always fascinated by the creative process. I just I'm always like like the way you speak. I hear it in your voice, like you're real. I understand it when, and I'm sure a lot of listeners understand when you when you say you know the kind of the character kind of uh, evolved by itself. That's what you seem to say, right? Well, yes, and the, and the, and there again, that's tricky because when it doesn't, and you're stuck with a character that doesn't seem to be um, moving or really coming to life, as a writer, that that's that's very frustrating. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, did, did you do you ever experience a, um, a writer's block? Oh yes, I do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I do. I, you know, I, I don't like to define it really as writer's block, but, but essentially that's what it is. I, I don't really find writing easy. Um, it takes, it's a very immersive process for me. So it takes all of my kind of heart and soul. And sometimes it, it really just has to be a discipline. You have to just sit down and, and write. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, Okay, so you, you say, how do you overcome writer's block? What do you do when when it happens? You know, yeah. you, sit, you sit down and you just thump away at those keys. And it really doesn't matter if you're writing rubbish. You, you just, 
you know, it's kind of like a muscle that you have to exercise. You don't want to go to the gym, but you do and you push yourself to do it. And eventually I think it becomes more, it flows more easily if you're, um, if your brain is kind of, oh, I've, I've actually got to do this now. I better be here, <laughs> um, you know, present in the moment and doing the work. Yeah. So yeah, sometimes you actually do have to force yourself to do it. Yeah, yeah. Because I, you know, it's hard for a lot of of writers and just I think artists in in general. Where it, it, I think as an artist, like for me now, I'm getting to know a lot of, especially authors now. Um, I think it's hard when you have to put your 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 work out to the world. You no, know, I I believe it's kind of where the writer's block comes from sometimes, where we're afraid of being criticized and you know that whole thing behind it where you have to put it out to the world and some people will like it, other people will not like it. And I think it's frightening for a lot of writers, in my opinion. Frederick, that's, I think that's very true. And, and it certainly contributes to, to a feeling of paralysis. Yeah. 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 I, th I think if you, you know, if a writer edits while they're writing a first draft, that can be um, almost like an anesthetic. You, you, uh, sorry, you said editing while writing the first draft? Well, you get, you, you, you know, if you watch yourself too closely while, while you are going through the process of, of getting a story out and worrying about what people are going to think of it and worrying about whether it's going to be a commercial success and those outside, those things outside of yourself can really impede your what is what is what can be a very delicate process mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah so you need to silence those voices if you can um and and that's sometimes a hurdle that a writer needs to get over yeah just to, to not worry about um what people are going to think not worry about trends and what's popular not you know just just to silence all those <clears throat> excuse me voices that are critical yeah Absolutely. I, I, uh, I'm enough for that. You know, you, you're going to get edited. You're going to get um, criticized. You, there will be time enough for that later, but it's not, it's not in the initial process of, mm -hmm. of, of creation. Yeah. Um, all right. So, um, okay, let's move on. Who is your, so I asked you who's your favorite character. What about your, your least favorite character? Um, <laughs> even, uh, even harder question than, <laughs> than the other one. No, you, you've got great question. I think you're doing a, a wonderful um, service for writers too. Thank you, by the way. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I guess one is always tempted to look at the antagonists. You know, in, in, in Grave, it would be the governor, the cop, or the killer. But maybe strangely, I had difficulty with Sophie Lawson, who's the American anthropologist, because I wrote her as a fairly passive character, someone to whom things happen. And while I could identify with her struggles, she's to some extent disempowered. She kind of accepts her life rather than claims it. So her power and identity were qualities she had to d rediscover in the midst of a crisis, you know, something terrifying that happens to her and forces her to change. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I found, I found her difficult. You found her difficult? I found her difficult to write, yes. Is it difficult because I think sometimes we can associate a passive character to a boring character? You understand yes. what I'm saying? It's a, yes, yes, very much so. Uh, you know, it can, she can be, she can tip into bland, mm -hmm. but the purpose of, my purpose was not necessarily to make, I mean, I want people to care about her, but I think that, there are people who are like that. There are there are some of us who do let our lives just happen. In some ways, I wanted her to be real, not always likable, not always um, present on the page. Even you know, at times, she has this kind of absent quality, which is is how she is. Mm -hmm. So I wanted somebody that that was real and somebody that we could we could kind of recognize. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So let me ask you, you, you created, uh, the Andean, Andean village of Colibri. Is that, is that pronounced right? Um, 
It's the vil- the village of Calibri, and yeah. Calibri actually means hummingbird in Spanish. Oh, okay. Oh, well, actually, it's a French word too. So uh, oh. anyway, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a bird in French. So I I I I'll check it. Maybe it's a, maybe it is a hummingbird. Actually. Well, all the name all the names of the places in the book are um, bird names. Mm. And and why? How, where did you find that inspiration to to? And why the village of Calibri? How 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 did it come to you? How did um, it come to you? I suppose it's a it's a blend of various sensibilities. I mean, there's there's the South American aspect, and there is the my own African um, sensibility, and then living in North America, there's there's a bit of that too. I wanted to set it in a place that was of my own con- construct that could reflect sort of the um, the notion of the outsider trying to live in a place that is is no longer familiar or isn't familiar at all. Um, and the reason I, I, I created a fictitious place was because there were elements that will be unfamiliar to everybody If you know what I mean, it's 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 a it's a strange, fantastical place. Mm. I think I yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. No, that it just just that it doesn't it doesn't faithfully um, represent a real place. Okay. There are aspects that do, but the sum of the whole is a place that I made up. Mm-hmm. And that most people will relate to. That's that's what I hear in you. Like. I hope so. I hope so, <laughs> because you know that—that's what world building really is about. World building is about creating a believable place that, however magical or fantastical it gets, it comes across as authentic. Yeah, um, there are writers who who are able. I think maybe you you fall in that category where they're able to create a world like you know sci-fi, fantasy, like they create, and then you, you seem to have the writers where. They have to experience something to be able to write it. Yes, it's it's kind of the the old um, ad, you know adage of of writing what you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Which I, I think is relevant. Um, I think that if you're coming off a base of of things that are familiar to you, like and and that will apply to your the way you write characters. It will possibly, you know, apply to the way you you deal with setting. Mm-hmm. And and but that was going to be my question. What that was going to be my question. Um, what comes easiest to you, characters, dialogue, or world building? Um, <laughs> it's interesting, Frederick, because in the case of grave of hummingbirds the actual issue an issue came to mind it was a um a photograph <clears throat> sorry that i saw in a magazine when i was sitting in a, a doctor's office and it was a, an image of an andean condor that was tied to the back of a bull so that image always stayed with me and and actually it still springs to mind at, at at odd moments so I knew it wasn't going to let me go until I explored it. Mm-hmm. So years of research followed and and the characters and setting and plot actually developed around that. Okay. okay. But I think that's unusual for me. Probably the you know once a character takes hold for me um and assumes breath and life the writing is actually easier because they then start to tell you what they're going to do and what they want to do and and that's not always the same as your intention yeah okay i hear you yeah so so uh, you would say that there's not like it's not s- like setting or character building and dialogue it, it's not one or the other that comes easier to you you would say that it's just Like you said, you you see a photograph, then uh, character kind of you get inspired by a character and kind of goes, you know, it kind of develops itself, right? So nothing, there's not something that comes easier or not. That's what I'm hearing. Um, I don't know if I pronounce it right, but no, no, yes, I I think it's a synthesis of those things. It's difficult yeah. for me to separate them out. Um, I, I suppose if you if you kind of had to say to me. 
you must separate them out. And I, I would actually say character is a good place to start. Yeah. If you have just the idea of a character in mind and you, you know, when you go to sleep at night, you think of that character or you, in moments of stillness, you, you know, aspects of that character come to you and you start writing those, those aspects down and the character begins to form. I think then you have the makings of a, of a story. Mm. Do, do you meditate? You know, I do. Um, not as often as I should or as I'd like to, but um, in fact, I'm trying to do more of it because I think it's it's the secret to a lot of things. You know, we're, we're very stressed and very rushed and there are so many stimuli coming at us now, especially with the internet and um, computers and laptops and phones, that those you know, those times of stillness are quite elusive. So I think we have to seek them out. And I try to. Are you somebody like for me, I have a, I'm beginning to have a hard time, I should say. Um, Cause you know, when you're, you're, I think when you're, you're a writer or you build a black, an internet platform, um, you know, you try to be on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, on, on all these things. And then it, like my cell phone now is almost becoming like, I, I'm always kind of looking at my cell phone and I, I, I think it, it, it relates to what you just said where it's, it demands a, a, a discipline to kind of, okay, no, no, I'll put the cell phone away. I put all that stuff away for 30 minutes. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to meditate or I'm not going to think about, you know, I'm not going to do all of that stuff. Well, may I ask you, do you meditate? Do you, fi do you manage to find those moments of stillness? Absolutely. And to me, in the morning is the best. I realize uh, okay. creatively, you know, I don't know. The, there's something about the morning for me. I'm an early riser um, and I do it 30 minutes now every morning. That's... Oh, wow. Yeah. Patrick, do you write? Are you, are you a writer or, or do you... Yes, absolutely. Actually, I um I finished my first book. I wanted to be edited and stuff, and I just wrote two other books that I want. I really want to publish in March, you know, in that in that that time period. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, that's great. I mean, it sounds like I should turn turn the tables and start asking you some questions. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I mean, what have you written? What 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 kind of books do you write? Well, basically, it's uh, about the search for love and life's purpose. That's basically okay. the main theme of my books. I love the, I love those subjects. And um, is it kind of genre based, or are you? Yeah, I, I'm gonna actually I'm gonna plan on on make it. Uh, there's romance in it, so I I is gonna go into a romance uh, genre. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Brave man. <laughs> well, no, yeah, yeah. To be honest, I'm not a specialist of the of the market. Like I I I really. I love to study the market, like, you know, but that's recent. That's been like in the last year, I shall say, I should say. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, because why, <laughs> because why do you say I'm brave? <laughs> well, I think romance is, it's, it's big and it's demanding and it, yeah. it can be very, um, what shall I say? Um, my, my concern, I have to, okay, sorry, I, I cut you off. No, no, carry on, go ahead. My, my go. concern is that I don't want to, because it's not like romance, let's say, like, I don't know, you know, Twilight or whatever, but because I understand that my worry is that women, I think, want romance to be written by other women. You understand what I'm saying? Well, I think there are men that write romance. Yeah, that's true. I think some of them pretend that they're women. Oh, um, oh, that's interesting. Well, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, with with pseudonyms, because I I think there is a is a an expectation, and I please correct me if I'm wrong, um, that that women do romance best. It I, I you know I don't know if you read a lot of romance, but I take my hat off to to romance writers. They go to places that are are difficult to navigate in, in to navigate well in writing. You know they 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 handle erotica very well. They 
take chances, they take risks, they get to the heart of things. Um, no, I, I think there are some magnificent romance writers. But, you know, uh, to be honest, uh, and, um, like my, my favorite author of all is, uh, is Paulo Coelho, right? Okay. The, the, the alchemist. I mean, this guy is just, to me, is amazing. So, um, you know, and I like Stephen King and I like, you know, uh, William Young, you know, like The Shack and all that stuff. So, I don't know, my, it seems that my creative juices kind of, like, there has to be a woman in there and there has to be a, uh, I kind of instinctively, there has to be a love story in it with, you know? Yes, but it also sounds like you lean towards inspiration. Yes, absolutely. So th that's why that's why I always say what my book about about it's about the search for love and the search for one's purpose. And those yeah. are big themes. Yeah, and and I, I to be honest, I'm not sure how to like you ask me which category am I. Well, I, I kind of said I know I kind of just went to, to romance because. I don't know. It's not just inspirational. It's not just romance. <laughs> yes. I resist categories. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I tend to be a hybrid myself, a hybrid author. All, all my books tend to be hybrids. But um, the booksellers need to know where, in the, where on the shelf to put a novel. So it, it's, it's yeah. one of the practical things that – a novelist has to take into consideration once the book is 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 ready then your publishers and your your booksellers are going to want to know where your book belongs or where it fits um yeah. so so i think that you know that is why we have this whole emphasis on 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 genre but there are a lot of people now who are are more hybrid oriented so i think you must just write the book you have to write Well, that's what I do, you know, and once they'll, when it'll be time to, to publish it and I, you know, I'm pretty sure the right terms or genre will come, come up to me. But for now, for now, I, I say it's romance, it's, you know. Okay. Well, let's see where it takes you. That's exciting. Yeah. That's exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So, uh, let, let's continue the conversation. When you're writing, um, I'm curious, do you use any celebrities sometimes or people you know as visual inspiration for the characters? I, I know that you said um, that, you know, sometimes they just come to you, right? Like like yes. this book. But um, sometimes, I mean, you know, that inspiration, does it come from some, does it come from celebrities or people you know? Well, you know, in the character of Anita, who's Gregory's late wife, I thought often of Penelope Cruz. Hmm. I'd seen her in, in Captain Corelli's Mandolin and um, that movie, uh, Vicky Cristina Barcelona. And probably in all her movies, she struck me as the perfect visual inspiration for Nita. Okay, so you do. So, yeah, so you do. I mean, would you agree that inspiration just can come from anywhere? Right. Yes, and I think I th it sometimes comes from really surprising places and you've just got to let it in. Yeah, absolutely. You have to be aware. I think you have to be kind of be present. I think that's what you mentioned earlier. You know, when, when you know, it, it's kind of, yeah, be in the moment. Yeah, and, and, and also trusting something even if it seems odd. Yeah, 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 yeah. So do you get that sometimes where, okay, you get kind of a ha-ha moment, you kind of, and, but your mind goes, well, what is that useful for? Why am I going to, like, my, that's what I get sometimes. The, the inspiration is there, but my mind kind of fights it for a while. Yes, I think I, I think that's a process of trust that we have to work at. Yeah, yeah. That that trust is is really important, you know, because I, I think as as human beings we tend to dismiss a lot of things we don't understand, and sometimes we don't have to. Sometimes we just have to follow something wherever it takes us, and understanding may come, and it you know maybe it won't. It doesn't really matter. It's 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 the engagement with that um, exploration that I think is so invigorating and 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 inspirational. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um. All right. Wh why did you choose? We talked about genre just a few moments ago. Why did you choose to write? I mean, 
Okay, Amazon says you're mystery, it's gothic, it's supernatural genre. Why did you choose those themes? Um, or, or why did you choose those categories? There you go. Why, why did you, why did why do you label your books in a way in those genre? Well, I guess I'm not afraid as a writer to go to dark places, you know. I, and I'm really intrigued by puzzles, which is 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 something that appeals to to readers who like mystery. I'm sorry, by, by whom? Um, uh, puzzles intrigue okay. me, you know. As, and as, I think suspension. Suspense and tension are really part of that too. Okay. So Grave of Hummingbirds is a gothic mystery because it unfolds in layers in a strange setting and, and also explores themes of romance and death or murder. So I, I really go to places in my mind that I wouldn't dare to in reality. And I think, I think that's what writers are all about, you know, storytellers. Can go to places that that you shudder to think of. I mean, if you think of of um, some of some of the movies that we see, for example, like Crimson Peak, and um, some of the real even horror, some of Stephen King's work. Okay. He's a nice guy, I'm sure. You know, he would he, he goes to places that yeah. you can only shudder at. Um, yeah. And I'm, as I say, I'm not afraid to go there. There, there. there are things that I pull back from and that I'm not willing to explore. I, I can't bear um, the torture of animals or, or children. Or um, I do have a, I have trouble with torture and, and a lot of horror. But um, mystery, mystery is great. You know, mystery, yeah. mystery unfolds in, in ways that keep you hanging on. And hopefully it all comes together in the end. Maybe a couple of threads left for the reader to figure out. It's fine. I like it. It it's just pulls me in. When you started to write, did you struggle with uh, what we talked about earlier? Like, which genre am I in? Like, did you struggle with that question? or? Um, I suppose my work really is literary fiction. So, hmm. I, okay, I get it. it. I did struggle with having to pigeonhole it, you know, into a really specific niche. But I think um, I naturally gravitated towards the dark, mm. the dark and the light and the way the two play against each other. And, um, you know, the themes of solitude and, and, and death and redemption in a way as well. So I was, I, I suppose I naturally, naturally gravitate towards, towards mystery or towards Gothic mystery at any rate. Okay. Okay. Um, give us an, in, an interesting fun fact about the, the creation of your, of your book. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, there, there, there are lots of ups and downs in writing and, and mm -hmm. at my lowest, when I thought Grave might never get published or I got lost in the editing process on more than one occasion, when I was like bouncing in the dirt of rock bottom, actual real hummingbirds showed up. Hmm. Yeah. It's, wow. And, 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 and that was actually a spiritual thing that happened because a single bird actually once played with my hair. With your hair? Yes, when I was watering the garden. Really? He came up behind me and he sort of rummaged in my hair with his little beak very gently. And I, you know, I took a breath and I stood completely immobile because that connection was, was phenomenal. It really was. And well, that's a fairly fun, interesting fact about wow. about the. It's certainly about having faith in moving on, moving forward, not giving up. Yeah. Wow. That that's that's special. Wow. <laughs> um, do, do, do you feel like because you talk about uh, you know it, it was it, it's a synchronistic synchronous anyway synchronistic uh, you you hear what I'm saying. Uh, moment, yes, right? very, um, very much so. I I don't know if 
if you can be creative and not spiritual and not believe in something higher. You understand what I'm saying? I do. I do. Um, Are you a very you seem to be you're a very spiritual person, obviously. Well, as, let me say that I'm a seeker. Mm, yeah. I I don't have any easy answers to anything. I do um, believe that there are things we don't understand. And I think that we're all connected. And I think that, unfortunately, we've begun to give separation more emphasis than, than our kind of a connectivity. So I, I look for things that are mystical or meaningful to me, you know, and they're there in small signs um, every day. And I might find it in the way a raccoon, for example, scrambles up a, a tree because the, the pugs have come out to play and it's frightened. Mm -hmm. It's 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 in the everyday, um, seemingly small things that happen that we find connections with everything, and it's not just with pe other people. It's with it's with all things that that live. Yeah. Um, not to get sanctimonious. I don't mean to get all. Um, well, no, it's fine. <laughs> but but I I, I I I I look for that. It's very yeah, to me. Th th there's a friend of mine who's a photograph, and um, and you know, he, I asked him one time, you know, hey, uh, you know, how do you like? What's the creative process of it? He just he just says, well, no, he, I mean, it's just being in the in the moment. Like it's just you know, he said it's, it's capturing the moment. Like, yeah, you got to capture it. And, and, and I think it's the same thing as a, it seems the way I hear you is the same thing as a writer. You kind of have to become an observer as opposed to like being always active. <laughs> you know, you have to kind of take a step back and observe, right? Am I? Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. I, you know, I think that also if you, if you think of poets, a poet looks for, it seeks to capture the essence of experience. And really, even to do that requires being present in the moment. And that's, that's difficult for us now. We're always looking into the past or, you know, facing the future with, with fear or with worry or with, um, I'm no stranger to this. I, I, I do it all the time. So I have to bring myself back to the present. I have to remind myself that really gratitude is central to to how i live in the moment yeah because that's where that's where your your i get your creative your creativity is yes all right guys for you the listeners of the boo geek unchained podcast audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service i personally recommend the audiobook the hobbit by jrr tolkien Or you can choose the audiobook of your choice for free by trying audible.com. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash Fred. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash Fred for your free audiobook. Uh, what was the biggest challenge during the, the write-up process of uh, Grave of Hummingbirds? Um... Well, you know, the, the challenge to me was I really wanted to be culturally sensitive. Um, what, what, what does that mean? Well, it, I didn't want to steal from other people's cultures and claim them as my own. You know, I think, I think when writers write about things like the Holocaust or um, about deeply traumatic events that they have no experience of you approach that particular subject matter with extra sensitivity and it, it's a different approach so you know i i was writing um i was writing about a region that i know very little about and it was important for me to work off a synthesis of universal sensibilities so to explore the common frailties and strengths that make us human regardless of our origins 
So crafting the novel became less about writing what I knew than building a fictitious world I knew very little about. But even in that, I wanted to um, I wanted to be sensitive. I wanted to be respectful. And I wanted to be not objective. It was tricky because I wanted to be objective, but at the same time I wanted to be immersed. So that that was a challenge. That was challenging for me. Okay. Interesting. Um, how much time did you need to finish? I mean, okay, so you took three years to write the whole story and publish it? No. Uh, sorry, sorry, five, uh, four years? Probably my whole life. No. <laughs> a couple of decades. It's very difficult for me to, to quantify okay. um, time where this novel is concerned because mm. it went through so many um, reworkings and rehashings. I, I, I think essentially the content hasn't changed from its original, but characters have been lost, characters have been added, the protagonist changed. So it's it's been more than four years, It's it, and it's been in my mind for much longer than that. And there was a lot of research that I had to do as well. Okay, wow. Um, if if you could change one thing about your novel, what would it be? Um, you know, I think maybe it would be a little bit longer. Hmm. How, 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 how long is it now? How many pages? It's it's uh, about it's it's just over two hundred pages, but I'd spend more time discovering why characters became who they are. You know, essentially, again, I wouldn't want to change the content, and I'm the kind of writer who really leaves a lot to the reader. Because, I, like we were saying, once a novel emerges into the world, it's no longer the writers but the readers to make of it what he or she wants to. And I really respect my readers. So it's it's a fine balance that I try to achieve it between saying too much, too little, and just enough to engage readers. And perhaps, like, alter a perception or think in ways she might not have before. And I may I may have needed, a, a you know, a little bit more time to do that. Okay. Okay. Um, what, what do you hope the reader will get out of the book? Frederick, I think that's difficult for me to say. I, and maybe in- it's just that, perhaps to, to alter a perception. I think to, it's... it's to, sorry, sorry, to what? To alter <coughs> perception? To alter a perception, yes. You know, you think in certain ways and you get used to certain things and the way of doing things, the way of writing, the way of um, reading. And I think this book is, is um, it offers the reader something that they really haven't explored before. It's, it's, it's going to take some reader's it draws it draws readers into a world that they haven't necessarily experienced before. It may be familiar to some, um, but I think to others, perhaps the vast majority of us, it would be like, "Whoa, you know what? What is this?" Mm. So, I'm hoping that will be intriguing. I'm hoping that that will be um, compelling. Mm. Okay, awesome. Um- you mentioned that uh, the works of Gabriel Garcia Marquez influenced your novel. Yes. Um, h- how did he inspire your writing style? Because he's an inspirational, I mean, he's a deep writer. Yes, yes. Well, you know, his literary style of, of magic real- realism really resonates strongly. And I think as does his exploration of themes of solitude and loss. Um of course, Marquez began his, his career as a journalist and then went on to become one of the most influential writers in Latin America. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he's, he's a big uh, uh, um, influence on Paulo Coelho, I know for a fact. <laughs> yes, and, and, and I think on a lot of, a lot of um, novelists, you know, yeah. he, with the hundred years of solitude and, and love in the time of cholera, achieved critical acclaim across the world. So, um, He's just a giant personality, a giant um, 
a, a, a giant writer for me. So yeah, I, I, I come kind of, let me just say that, that, that he was, he was very much an inspiration mm-hmm. to, to the way I approach my own writing. What is the biggest myth about being a novelist? That it's easy or that it's quick. You know, the novel is is, is a really demanding master and it's it's multi-layered and multifaceted. And a story can can require years to settle into its ideal form or even its optimal form. Yeah, I, I, I mean, some some authors are really prolific and they write quickly, but I don't. So, for me, it's. I think there's this perception that oh, we can all be J.K. Rowling, or not all of us, but we can. You know, look, it's easy. You write a book; it it takes a month, and we have NaNoWriMo now, which is is. You know, everybody writes 50,000, not everybody, I'm making these sweeping generalizations, but people who, who participate are able to write 50,000 words in a single month. And I admire that so much. It's, it's, that's where the discipline and the participation comes in. It's, it's really fabulous. If, you know, it, it's something to do. It's something to try. I'm, I met a few. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 you go ahead. I'm... No, I, I met a few of my fellow writers um, at NaNoWriMo actually like two, three years ago. Yes. And I, I think NaNoWriMo is a great thing to connect with other writers because it's hard, I think, for a lot of people, a lot of writers to kind of get to know other writers in their area. You understand what I'm saying? I, mean, but I guess it depends on which area. I mean, obviously, if you live in New York, Manhattan, I guess, you know, <laughs> there are many writers there or even California, but... Um, I don't know here in Montreal. Yes. Like especially where the the most of the people are uh, French speaking people. Um, you know it's even harder to get to English speaking writers. <laughs> well, you know, I mean that's a networking thing. Yeah. And of course there are conferences and 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 um places where you can you mm-hmm. can meet. But I think the the Writing is such a solitary pursuit, you know, that it's, you spend days or, or months alone with your thoughts and, and your, your process. And it's a concerted effort to go out there and, and connect with other people and connect with, um, with fellow writers. But I think it's a very important thing to do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and it, it's a very nourishing thing to do as well because we know how, we know how we feel, you know, we know how, we know what it's like. It's, it's, it can be very tough. Yeah. The, the other time I was at a, um, it, it, I, I was with a few of those fellow writers and, um, we were like, I couldn't believe where we were like, I think we were like maybe 10 or 12. We yes. all, like, we all, um, put tables together at a cafe, at a coffee shop. And like, it's what is, it was like a Saturday evening. And I, I, I don't know. I had this epiphany where all these people could be anywhere else at this time with, you know, I don't know, to clubs or <laughs> with their friends doing whatever. But we're all here with a little laptop. <laughs> we're all kind of focused. We're all there. We don't, we, you know, we don't really talk to each other, right? Like we're just all focused on our work, right? And then we kind of chat and then we go back to our work. I don't know. I just found it like, you got to have a real passion for it. Like it's got to, I don't know. It's amazing. It's amazing. Well, you know, you would probably really enjoy a writer's retreat then because then you could have a weekend or a few days to do yeah. that. With it. And, I, and I think, we're, you know, retreats can be wonderful. Like imagine a retreat in the Tuscan hills of Italy or, or, or somewhere here by the coast, you know, where you can – be with fellow writers, writing, sharing, sharing each other's um, work to some degree. Mm. I think that's that's wonderful if you can do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I never did it, but uh, something that I will for for sure I will experience it one day. Yes. Um. Um. So, w- what is a typical day in the life of an author? Do you have any, so, do you have any writing habits? Like earlier, you spoke a little bit about it, but uh, uh no. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm really 
bad with habits. Um, I don't, and I, you know, I really admire writers who, who are able, I, they like clockwork. They have a, a rhythm and they have a, a set. Maybe I need, in fact, you know, maybe I need to do more of that. Forcing myself to, to sit in one place and, and, and have a routine. But I don't. I don't. Okay. okay. Does creativity comes to you, does creativity come to you more in the morning or evening or it doesn't really matter? I'm not a great morning person, unlike you. Mm -hmm. um, night is good for me. Mm. Stuff happens at night, and, and, and it can sometimes be um, very late at night. I, you know, sometimes I can write very, very late at night. Mm. See, see I, yeah, I have a hard time doing it. Oh, really? Yeah, for some reason, I don't know. <laughs> it means the morning, really. But uh... well, I, I think a lot of people feel the way you do. Do they, do, do they? Yeah, morning. You know, morning is you bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and chirpy, and ideas are flowing, and you can settle into that, um, settle into the day, and mm. and it's really early, so the day spreads. Well, you know, that's not me. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I want my coffee, and bed is such a wonderful place. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> All right, we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up. Um, do do you have um other passions aside from aside from writing? Do you have other? Uh... I I love ballet, mm. and I love movies. Movies are probably a very big passion of mine. Um, doing movies or no, no, writing no. movies? Do, no, 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 <laughs> watching them. Just, oh, okay. <laughs> in fact, I, I, I can often binge watch um, a good series. Mm. Uh, I, I, I love getting, getting lost in, in, in a good movie or a good, a good crime series or a good fantasy series. Mm. Passion, animals are my passion too. Um, I, uh, I read that, um, you used to own a ballet studio and outreach program in Jordansburg, where much of your focus centered around, um, you know, unraveling unsound muscle memories. I was, what was that exactly? And, and, and you were building new and healthy ones. Yes. Well, 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 you know what, what ballet is, isn't really a natural inclination for the body. So, f and, and, and ballet dancers, I would, I would argue are probably, the world's greatest athletes. Um, mm. So to, if your training doesn't embrace a very sound technical foundation, um, building muscles in such a way as to accommodate that level of, of, of athletic effort, then um, you get injured. Mm. You get tendonitis, you um, tear all sorts of, of um muscles in ways that you don't want to and so i and, and basically your body would be in a position where it's formed a muscle memory that is 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 painful and and wrong for for um general movement or facility in walking or in just the normal way one lives one's one's or moves through life so i would have to retrain that muscle mm, okay is it a so is the connection between the mind and the body basically like yes it, yeah. so um but a muscle itself has a memory i know this is now getting a little bit um maybe technical or esoteric mm -hmm. but a muscle has a memory and when it's an unhealthy memory that leads to other muscles compensating for it and it 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 becomes, it, it can lead to things like arthritis, tendonitis, all sorts of um, painful inflammation. Okay. But if you train your muscles, if your posture, and, and that deals with things like posture, um, you can actually save yourself a lot of um, grief later in life if you, if you know how to carry yourself and you know what muscles to use to, to keep your body supported. Um, all right. What other services do you provide? I'm an editor, Your... so I help people, um, bring out the best in their, in their work. Mm -hmm. I, um, 
I've been doing freelance editing for a while. And um, I'm quite tough. I'm not brutal, but I'm I'm tough. Mm-hmm. And you know, I, I I do I do some cover design and and book trailers for for people. It's not necessarily my focus. I'm now focusing a lot more on on writing, but I do help people um, with editing. Mm, okay. Um, all right. So, and where can we find you and uh, buy your books? Well, the that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I live in San Francisco. Uh, <laughs> the book, the, my a Grave of Hummingbirds is available on, on, on Amazon and a Grave of, hum, Grave of Hummingbirds. And it'll launch on the 1st of January. I think it's up for pre-sale now. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a website, www.jenniferskotelskiauthor.com. And that has all my links to Facebook and Twitter and um Pinterest, LinkedIn, Tumblr. Yes, I love Tumblr. Yeah. By the way. How, how do you spell it? I'm never sure how to spell that thing. Tumblr? You, you said Tumblr? It's T-U-M-B-L-R. Yeah. It's weird to, I don't know. It's hard I know. to. It's kind of quirky. <laughs> yes. All right, Jennifer. Well, uh, that's it. Uh, it's been really lovely to to talk to you, and I'm I'm so grateful you've been generous with your time and your questions. Oh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I'm honored. Uh, seriously. Thank you. <laughs> I'm very glad. Keep writing. Keep at it, and and I'm going to look for your books. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. And and you know what, Jennifer? Good luck for 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 your book, for for I, your stuff. Really. Thank you so much, Frederick. <laughs> All right, guys, it's time to ride off into the sunset. Hey, um, how was how was the interview? How deep, true, how sweet is she? Go pick up her book. I want to thank Jennifer Skatelsky for her insightful conversation. What a wonderful, kind lady. Um, I love, 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 love this conversation. <laughs> um, uh, she, it was smooth. He, she is deep. Uh, go pick up her novel right now. Grave of Hummingbirds available on Amazon. And uh, I mean, you're going to have a good time. You're going you're gonna to read a great story. And, um, and that's it, brothers and sisters. That's about it. Um, catch me on Facebook. Frédéric Bai on Twitter. At by Fred. YouTube channel. The Boo Geek for previous episodes. And guess what, guys? A new podcast will be on air real soon so wait there's a lot of great stuff coming up uh this year 2016 is gonna be a great and awesome year i guarantee you this i have booked (laughs) a lot of interviews with great people and if you love art if you love books you're, you're gonna love this you're gonna love this place all right guys with this i'm gonna stop gloating i'm gonna stop i'm gonna stop um um you know <laughs> self promoting myself <laughs> but um with this i wish you a happy new year stay safe and don't forget live with purpose passion and love bye bye <laughs>